Thank you everyone for being here. I really, it, it's so heartwarming to see so many people passionate about pollinators getting together. Uh, I know James City County, we have definitely a lot of passionate groups and people. Um, so this is sort of amazing. <laughs> um, so just a quick uh, introduction. My name is Emma Zarin Newman. I'm a teacher at Matoka Elementary School and in my spare time, I volunteer with the Clean County Commission and I serve as co-chair with Peg Borman uh, and we are passionate about the education aspect of sustainability and stewardship in our county. And we've been talking a lot lately about how to make our outreach a little bit more action-based um, and getting our volunteers sort of cohesive and involved so that we can actually move forward and make more effective change um, for the better. So, the stewardship hour, uh, this is our first one, we're see, gonna see how it goes, um, but ideally every month we'll sort of pick a new topic and get a bunch of people together and get some actions going uh, and we'll learn about an expert. We're so lucky to have Adrian Frank today. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> um, and kind of give citizens a chance to ask questions, engage, and then we can sort of talk about what we can do and what we can walk away with uh, to actually affect change. So today we're going to hear from uh, Adrienne on pollinators. She's going to give uh, about a 20 minute talk. Uh, then we'll do a short, a brief question and answer time, but I do want to be respectful of it's sort of the dinner time hour. So any questions that we don't get to during that segment, well, you can definitely visit back, circle back to those at the end uh, and sort of stick around and chat a little bit longer. But uh, we'll get to a few right after Adrian talks. Uh, then we're going to talk about different actions we can all be taking. So first we'll talk about what you can do and what you can teach others. Volunteer actions we can take as a group. Uh, rules that we can change. How we can support, support the economy when it comes to pollinators. Then, this is really important, I want this to stick in everyone's minds. There's an exit ticket, which is a survey. Um, that I really encourage everyone to, to go for and uh, take. That way we can get some good feedback on the stewardship hour, but it's also where you can let me know if you would like a copy of the video of this re uh, Zoom recording, or if you want a copy of my uh, PowerPoint presentation. That won't include uh, Adrian's PowerPoint uh, presentation, but that way you can have the access to all the resources that are in here. Um, anything that's underlined in this presentation can later on be clicked on uh, to lead you to a resource um, for whatever that underlined thing is talking about. Then there's a little brief uh, resource page and you can stick around and we can keep talking if you want. <laughs> uh, I do want to apologize in advance. I'm really bad with time and so I wear a watch always uh, and I'm going to try and really keep this on on track here um, but I apologize if it feels like I'm rushing anyone I've asked someone to talk and then I'm cutting them off after three minutes uh, I do I apologize in advance for that um, and then again we will have all of this information or most of it in a pdf later on it's going to be a lot of information from a lot of different angles so don't worry about trying to write down something you, you, you know, taking a note or um, trying to remember it in your brain, I can send this out to everyone so that you don't have to feel like you're, have to take notes or anything like this. Um, that's the teacher in me, I have to give that caveat. <laughs> All right, so today we're gonna try to uh, understand which species are the major pollinators in our area of James City County. Remember which actions can impact pollinators positively and negatively evaluate our current habits and figure out which habits we can change to protect uh, and support the pollinators in our area. So I'm going to introduce to you now uh, Adrienne Frank. Adrienne has lived in Williamsburg since 1978 with her husband Gary. They both enjoy gardening, birding, butterflying, and all things nature. They have both been members of the Historic Rivers chapter of the Virginia Master Naturalist since 2008. Adrian's mother was a botanist and she learned early about plants and ecology. Her professional career was an occupational therapist and administrator at Child Development Resources for 40 years. Even before retirement, she began learning a lot about butterflies by participating in butterfly counts, collecting data on local butterflies, and educating others about identification, behavior, 
host plants, and habitat. Every year in August, she coordinates the annual Williamsburg Area Butterfly Count and submits that data to the North American Butterfly Association. She is a board member of the Native Plant Society and the Friends of Dragon Run. Um, I want to make sure that uh, Adrienne can can get every, we can get everything out of Adrian that we possibly can. So if you have questions for Adrian that you think you might want to ask later, please type them into the chat feature of the Zoom, and that way uh, we can pull them up later a little bit easier. Um, and that way we can just sort of let Adrian speak. So Adrian, I hand it to you, uh, figuratively and somehow over the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um. So um, a lot of the work that we that I do is with the Virginia Master Naturalist, but also the Coastal Virginia Wildlife Observatory, and uh, they sponsor some of the little citizen science activities that we do and the annual counts that we do. Um, this uh, presentation is primarily of um, insects in our garden um, or in the area, <clears throat> and is. Um, some of the, the, the pictures are from good friends uh, and an entomologist who lent me some really interesting and close-up pictures. So I'd like to acknowledge everybody for the use of their photographs. So what is a good pollinator? Um, a bee that flies around traveling from flower to flower is, is a good pollinator. Um, they select a variety of uh, pollen sources. They have hairs and scales to collect the pollen. So if you look at this honeybee, it's kind of unrecognizable because it has hairs all over its head, all over its body, and it's just covered with pollen. <clears throat> Another characteristic of, of good pollinators um, is that they have specialized mouth parts. So here is a honeybee and um, you can see the pollen is collected on their hairs but also on their legs and they um, make these chaps with their mouths uh, as they to court you know to consolidate all of the pollen that they're carrying around with them but they get pollen covered all over every place um, they have specialized body parts, and here's an example of a bee's tongue, and you can see how long that tongue is for the body size of the insect. Um, but it, here it's using it to clean its cells, but it also is using it to extract um, pollen um, from the, the nectar from the plants that it visits. Here's a black swallowtail, and the black swallowtail is a, is a really good pollinator. Uh, and that one, uh, this butterfly, we often see in our gardens. Um, and it takes its proboscis and unrolls the proboscis uh, to gather nectar and to wick the pollen uh, and the nectar out of the flower. Um, and then in the meantime, it gets hit, uh, pollen all over its body and then is able to take that to the next flower. So here are some uh, just examples of insects in the yard. Um, and here's a, a katydid inside of a hibiscus plant, a, a rose mallow, I think. And um, it probably is pollinating because it's in there, it's getting nectar, and if it moves to another flower, then it's gonna be pollinating. Um, but it's not really that good because it doesn't have very many hairs on its body. Whoops, back. Um, this picture of the caterpillar, here this is a tomato hornworm caterpillar and the caterpillar turns into this sphinx moth. And the sphinx moth is a great pollinator because of it's got uh, hairs and cells that can collect uh, pollen. But in the, as a caterpillar, it's not really a pollinator. This is wasps' eggs on the back of the, um, of the caterpillar, and those wasps will eventually kill the caterpillar. A wasp and a dragonfly have uh, relatively no hairs and they're predators, so they're not exactly good pollinators. So who are the pollinators? Bees, butterflies, moths, beetles, flies, birds, and bats. 
They all have uh, specialized ways of collecting. They have preference for different flowers by sight, smell, uh, and access. So day versus night. A hummingbird likes orange, red orange, trumpet vine, but a bat is going to be attracted to the smell of the open flower at night. So the difference between visualizing and, and smelling or finding other ways to, to uh, approach a, a plant. Moths are typically tent shaped and their wings are held together um, by what they call a frenulum. Um, and uh, they look a little bit different than butterflies in flight, so you can tell them apart. And there are day flying moths and night flying moths. So the night flying moth is gonna be attracted to uh, strong, sweet smelling things, tubular flowers, but they don't care that much about the color of the flower. Daytime moths, like the clear wing moths, or this owlet, are more attracted to the colors and the sweet odors of the, of the um, flowers. Flies, it says that they prefer dull, green, cream-colored flowers with translucent patches um, or dark purple flowers. Well, if you think about the pawpaw, the pawpaw is um, pretty um, smelly, but it's not a sweet smell. It's more like um, scat. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a pretty heavy smell, um, and it's pollinated by a fly. Um, there are lots of flies that we've had in the garden, um, and this nocturnal horsefly over here uh, is something that our entomologist had never seen before, and I just happened to get a photograph of it during the daytime. Uh, this bee fly looks like a bee, but it's a fly. The wing shape is different. The eyes are in a different position. The robber fly is actually this um, insect on the top and it's killing a bumblebee. So a robber flea fly is a predator, but it looks like the bumblebee and so therefore it um, is a, it's good for stealth. Um, beetles can do some pollination and here it says that they prefer bright white, yellow, and blue, but in my yard um, they seem to be attracted to some of the orange flowers as well, so it doesn't always uh, they don't always follow the rules. Honeybees, um, imported about 400 years ago from Europe. If you, um, if we didn't have honeybees, if we had the collapse of the honeybees. Adrian it's, Frank, the one who was here for the bee count. Oh. Uh, I hear. Um, so um, no bees, no ice cream. So it uh, it, uh, the bees are used and sometimes they travel, um, uh, they are taken uh, to um, all the different crops across uh, the United States and other countries. Native bees, there's 4,000 species of ground and twig nesting bees in the United States and they pollinate 70% of all the flowering plants. Um, and they, are, they come in all sizes. Uh, so here's just an example of a bumblebee and then a, a little sweat bee, I believe. Um, but they have tongues of varying lengths um, and they uh, produce um, when pollen is abundant. Native bees, you usually think of bumblebees and mason bees, um, carpenter bees, digger bees, or sweat bees, um, but um, there are actually some of each of these type of bees in each family of bees. Bees are really, really complicated. So if you um, want to identify a bee, uh, any kind of a bee, they have um, eyes on the sides of their heads and they have thin, antenna uh, and they have hairs on their body. But if you're looking to identify different kinds of um, bees and um, figure out one bee from another, um, you have to look at the structure of their face and you have to look at the length of their tongue uh, and the structure of their wings in order to figure out which family in, they are in. There's like six large families of bees uh, and lots and lots of different types. And of course, then you have solitary bees and parasitic bees and bees 
there are bees that only go to one type of flower. So if we lose that flower, then we lose um, uh, that bee. Butterflies are great pollinators and they are all over uh, the plants. Uh, this year is kind of a slow year um, uh, for, for butterflies, but we had about seven species in the yard today. Um, we had these zebra swallowtails on our butterfly weed, and we had a skipper on our um, Monarda, our wild uh, bergamot. Milkweed, everybody talks about milkweed and how important it is for, um, for uh, monarchs especially, um, but there are several different kinds of milkweeds. There is the common milkweed, which uh, is where the monarchs will lay their eggs, but monarchs will also use butterfly weed, this orange one, <coughs> and uh, swamp milkweed or purple milkweed, uh, but they can also use sand vine and honey vine. And of course, what makes a plant a milkweed, it's one that um, when you break the leaf or the stem, there's uh, milk that seeps out. What will a caterpillar uh, do if it lays its eggs on your milkweed plant um, and, it's you, and you only have one milkweed plant and you have 100 uh, caterpillars? Well, they in, eat the entire plant, um, stems and all. And this particular butterfly weed plant had a lot of caterpillars on it, and they ate so much of it that, they, that the next year we didn't have a plant left. They, they ate the entire thing. Um, butterflies have um, larval host plants, and so the butterflies will lay their eggs on all different kinds of plants. Um, trees, shrubs, vines, um, grasses and herbs, uh, all sorts of different things, and each butterfly goes to a different plant or a different set of plants. So the butterfly that is the kind of the most common and obvious around uh, here is the eastern tiger swallowtail, and that actually lays its eggs on the tulip poplar tree, on the tops of the tulip poplar tree. Um, there are some non-native nectar plants uh, that uh, butterflies and bees and beetles use, uh, and a lot of people have lantana and mountain mint and uh, zinnias in their yard and butterfly bush. Um, these are not native plants, but they have a lot of good nectar, and so the, the uh, insects love them. Annuals, uh, you think about the things that you grow in your yard, um, they are primarily non-native plants. Um, and uh, maybe the am some of the species of amaranth are, are native, but a lot of these aren't. The, the ones on um, the left-hand side in the light, whiter color are things that we have in our garden that they seem to prefer. So the butterflies around here <clears throat> really like these plants. Um, we saw 200 uh, common buckeyes migrating down the York River and they were landing on a bone set. Um, and mist flower in, the, in late summer, if there's no other flowers around, the butterflies will go to that. Perennials are um, usually what you think of as being the flowering plants that the pollinators go to. And, um, most of these in white are, um, are plants that are really liked by a lot of the pollinators. Herbs and fruit trees and vegetables, um, a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, pollinators go to those. Shrubs, um, favorite uh, in the dismal swamp is the button bush, and we've seen tons of wonderful um, uh, butterflies and moths and other insects on button bush. Uh, sweet pepper bush or clethra is another one uh, that um, lots of butterflies like to go to. Vines, um, if you're growing vines or if you find vines in our area, 
chances are you're going to find something that is either aggressive or invasive. Uh, the Asian um, sweet autumn or the or clematis, um, you see that a lot, um, but it's often the Asian one and not uh, the native one. The Asian one seems to be kind of taking over and crowding out other plants. Same thing with the wisteria. Um, Little Creek is just filled with um, uh, Asian uh, wisteria that's just covered all of the trees. But some favorites uh, for our pollinators are um, the passion vine and the trumpet vine and, and uh, the honeysuckle. Uh, trees that butterflies love, um, hackberries. There's two types of butterflies that, that uh, are um, always on the hackberry trees. Uh, and so here is the hackberry and the tawny emperor. And this is a great purple hair streak. You can't see it very well, but it loves devil's walking stick. And devil's walking stick is a great uh, pollinator plant. You can see there's even ants uh, on this uh, on this uh, plant. Uh, it also makes a really good plant for the birds in the fall. They eat all of the berries. Uh, trees for bees. Um, when the, the sumac is blooming, their bees are just, just cover this, this tree. Uh, right here you can see a little tiny uh, bee on there now. And a lot of the um, flowers are not quite open on this one. If you are um, hoping to uh, attract butterflies or other pollinators to your yard, it's a good idea to think about planting in layers, that your trees are going to attract some and your uh, shorter trees and your shrubs um, and your flowering plants and uh, even uh, the ground cover is going to be um, attracting um, your pollinators. Today I saw a variegated fritillary trying to lay eggs on the violets in the yard. Threats to pollinators, um, development, pesticides, use, changing weather patterns, um, tons and tons of things. The natural predator like a spider um, is probably the only good uh, predator that we have, the only good threat, <laughs> natural threat that we have. Um, Invasive plants, we have so many invasive plants in our area. Uh, it's, they're all over our yard. It's hard to control them. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a threat to the pollinators because these native plants are host to other insects. So for example, a tree of heaven the, is a, is, has its own moth. Um, and uh, that moth we see all around um, in our neighborhoods uh, nowadays. Not so fun fact, according to US Fish and Wildlife Service, homeowners use 10 times more chemicals on their lawns uh, than farmers put on their crops. Um, you shouldn't really have to use a lot of chemicals if you have good uh, biodiversity in your garden. So here's my husband and he's in the middle of the garden and we've been trying to get rid of as much lawn as possible over the years. Uh, we uh, try to get our flower beds to be bigger. We try to mow uh, a little bit less or mow higher and it's a good idea not to um, just in indiscriminately uh, kill insects. You can put other things in your lawn. Uh, that uh, are substitutes for lawns. Um, and we, uh, a lot of these are a little bit slow growing, but we put a patch of pussy toes in and we put, put a patch of Corsican mint in um, around our little pond. Uh, white clover is really, uh, it's not a native, um, but it is a good lawn substitute, and it puts a lot of nitrogen back in the soil. Uh, and the white clover is, is pretty hardy and can uh, last through uh, droughts and, and, uh, and things. 
uh, plant islands is, is a good way to go. So you don't necessarily have to get rid of your entire lawn. Uh, at first, you can start by planting groups of plants together uh, in, uh, as a plant island. And these are just a couple of things that we have in our yard and some examples of what you could put uh, in, in your plant island. A water island is a nice thing. Cardinal flower, when it's blooming, is just wonderful. It attracts hummingbirds and butterflies and beetles uh, and, um, and all sorts of things. And it blooms for a fairly long time. What can you do to attract uh, pollinators? You can learn about insects and their habits. You can plant food that caterpillars are going to eat. You can plant in sunny locations. You can plant uh, for continuous bloom. Uh, one year, when we were um, uh, watching the butterflies over time, we noticed that the butterflies would go from one plant to the next plant to the next plant. And finally, when all of the other flowering plants were done and the only thing that was left in the yard was a marigold, uh, the, the, the insects were going to the marigolds. You can provide damp areas um, for the butterflies uh, to nectar from or to pick up nutrients from, uh, and you can uh, put out a stone for them to sit on and bask in the sun. You can add rotting fruit. Uh, butterflies love that. The bees uh, ate most of our pears one year. Uh, they were having uh, a good time. Um, you can advocate for habitat, um, preservation and restoration in your neighborhoods, along the power lines, uh, in the parks and public spaces. Uh, you can advocate for less mowing, fewer chemicals, planting in layers. Um, one of the things that I've been talking to uh, whoever will listen uh, about is the fact that we mow so much um, that we mow in the parks and the power lines. We mow right up to the trees and we don't allow any shrubs or any wildflowers uh, to bloom. And, uh, and the <clears throat> fields where we have crops growing, uh, we use so much Roundup that we kill all of the um, plants that are along the roadsides. And so it's very difficult for us to um, support the pollinators if our habitat is really uh, decreased. So that's about it. I'll stop sharing and, uh, and back to Emma. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adrian. That was amazing. I feel like I just learned a thousand new things all at once. So Adrian, there were a few questions in the chat about why this is such a slow year for butterflies and then also for hummingbirds. And I uh, wonder if you have any uh, answers to those. Well, um, early this year, uh, we had quite a few good butterflies. Um, and then we had a really late frost. And uh, we have just, a lot of them were, were devastated. Um, they were devastated by, uh, by the frost. We went, uh, one, of, one of our good friends went over to Warhill and counted 61 pearl crescents one day. And then the next, like two days later, Gary and I went over to Warhill and we could only count about six of them. And they were they looked really battered. So I think that that late late frost and the roller coaster temperatures have really affected the butterflies, um, and uh, they are very slow this year. And people have been noticing that that not only around here but in other places, um, there is a huge concern, as you know, about um, the roller coaster temperatures and. Uh, climate change and the fact that we are losing um, insects by the millions. Uh, so, uh, for example, a friend of ours was uh, drove up to New England, and they said it's striking that the car is not covered with dead insects anymore. So, there, we've just lost a tremendous 
number of insects. And when you lose the insects, of course, you're going to be losing the bird species. And then there are all the other threats uh, to the bird species. So, for, for example, with hummingbirds, you think about where do they spend the winter? Well, if they're spending the winter in places where there's a lot of deforestation, then they're going to be losing their habitats, their winter habitats, uh, and uh, that's, that's kind of causing a problem. Thank you, Adrian. There's another question in the chat um, from Catherine. Catherine, do you want to unmute yourself and ask this question? I don't think I know how to pronounce that word. <laughs> oh, what part? Oh, I was going to ask if you wanted to ask your question out loud to, to Adrian. So I, I, see, oh, I see the lantana. I, maybe that's what you did. Lantana, thank you. <laughs> and there's often ants associated with on sunflowers, like on lantana, you'll always see it. Or now you just mentioned there are ants on the devil's walking stick, and you know how they're always over a peony. But mm -hmm. but I didn't know if there was any association or symbiotic relationship or anything that you know of. And you well, know, mentioned the ants. I was wondering <laughs> on the uh, devil's walking stick. Well, um, there's there might be an association if it was a native plant. The lantana is not a native plant. No. Wherever that might be native or where it or, or originated, you might have had a symbiotic relationship with insects or other um, uh, fauna. Um, we don't really know all about the complex relationships that there are. Yeah. But we do know, for example, that sometimes ants and caterpillars have relationships. So um, just recently, uh, we uh, identified uh, a new butterfly for our area called an Edwards hair streak. Well, in the literature, it talks about how the caterpillars have re this relationship with the ants and maybe actually uh, kind of using each other underneath underneath the, the oak tree that they're um, that the that the butterflies are uh, the caterpillars are eating um, and and the ants are going up and down the tree and and um, and doing something whatever it is that they yeah. do with uh, with the with those caterpillars well it's just just goes to show you, we always don't know what what is needed, and what, and you know when you break off one piece of the chain, yeah, a lot of other things are affected. So. And so ants are going to enjoy the nectar of any plants, right. any flowering plants, and they're going to take that back to their nest. Yeah, Thank or you. just get or just get nutrients from it. Right. That's so interesting how it's all connected. Um, I wanted to point out that on this slide, uh, if you wanted to have this PowerPoint as a PDF, um, Adrian has been kind enough to provide us with two separate handouts. Um, so here it says selected plants for pollinators. It's a list that she's compiled uh, specific to the Williamsburg area uh, of, of plants that you could plant in your own garden uh, that are pollinator plants. And then here's some more pollinator resources that she's compiled uh, to learn more about pollinators. Uh, thank you so much, Adrian. We're going to move on to our actions now. Um, now, there are five different types of actions that we're going to sort of go through, and a couple people are going to chime in and talk a little bit about specific aspects of these. Um, first, we'll start with our individual behavior change. So this is something that Adrian actually touched on quite a bit in her presentation. Uh, this, these are changes that we can make ourselves or we can teach others to make uh, planting native plants and plant nectar uh, plant nectar sources. And then again, I tagged her, uh, Adrian's handout there to help you plan your own garden maybe or a garden uh, you work on with a friend. Uh, we need to reduce invasive species such as the kudzu, the stilt grass, and the Chinese wisteria. We also need to reduce lawns, chemicals, and mowing. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day. You know, if you were to, if you had small children in your house and you were going to have someone come and clean your house, but you didn't want them to use bleach, you would communicate that with the person coming to clean your house. In the same way, uh, if, if you want to be friendly to pollinators, you can communicate with people coming to work on your lawn uh, or, or your family as a group chore, you know, 
having a specific uh, mowing schedule that's maybe only a few times a year, uh, those sort of changes can really help pollinators. So the next type of action we can take is volunteer action. Uh, now, I have a couple things to get through on this slide and then we're gonna hear from John and Wright and I'm so excited to hear from him too. So uh, as volunteers together as a group, we can plant pollinator gardens in parks and public spaces. So if you are interested in planting a pollinator garden or being a part of planting a pollinator garden in a James City County Park, then it's really important to fill out that exit ticket and let me know that you're interested uh, because that's definitely something that is going to be happening just with COVID-19. Uh, our anticipated date of the fall might be changing, um, but that's definitely something that the county is looking into and volunteers are probably needed to get that all done. So if you want to volunteer for that, let me know in the exit ticket. Or uh, you can organize your own in your own communities. So, um, Ben Cottingham from Matoke Elementary School. I hope you're listening to this because we should totally do a pollinator garden <laughs> at school, um, at your church, at your school, your HOA. Uh, you can organize your own. And these uh, underneath section two, item A, B, C through F, uh, these are some resources that are PDFs where the work has sort of already been done a little bit when it comes to the designing. Each one of these is a plan for a pollinator garden with suggested plants. And then for each plant, it gives you a few alternative yeah, plants. Well. Um, so you can sort of cross-reference a few different lists that are provided here. And if you're wondering how on earth am I gonna pay for this, I want to give you a plug for a really great grant that Charles <laughs> uh, and I have uh, revised last year. Uh, the Good Neighbor Grant, it's a matching grant that the Clean County Commission gives out to neighborhoods, but not necessarily HOA organizations. Uh, we talked earlier about how a high school would qualify. Uh, it can get up to $500. And since it's a matching grant, people are sometimes hesitant, but I want to tell you that volunteer hours count, and they're valued at $27.50. So I think that's a little over 18 hours of volunteering and you've matched your $500 and you can plant your pollinator garden. Um, and Adrian told me the other day, it's not too late to start. Um, the application is due September 1st. So you can take this back to your communities and see if that's something that you want. All right, now I wanted to ask John Enright to tell us a little bit about how this has been a success story for him over at St. Martin's Episcopal Church. Um, John, can you hear me? <laughs> oh, thank you, Emma. John, we'd love uh, to hear from you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm an example of what happens when you become a little bit aware of, of something. Uh, about a year and a half, almost two years ago, a friend of mine uh, suggested that I take a course called the uh, Virginia Master Naturalist, which I was had no knowledge. And uh, Long story short, Adrian and about 15 other people came and lectured uh, over the 16 or so meetings that we had. And one of the things I learned was all about, not all, but something about pollinators and how threatened they are and how uh, important pollinators are to our environment. So I've been walking by this patch of grass at our church for probably a thousand times and uh, said, just walk by one day after having taken this course. Uh, I said, you know, that would be a great place for a pollinator garden. So I, I came up with an idea and I approached a member of our vestry and he said, well, write it up. And I did. Uh, they took it to the meeting and the vestry said, sounds like a good idea. There are some members on our vestry who are also master naturalists and there's a uh, one or two uh, master gardeners as well. So it was well received. Uh, I came up with an idea, just you see the S pattern there just for no i'm not a, a garden uh, you know landscape architect or anything i just came up with an idea and, and fit that space overall it's about 65 feet long and about 20 feet wide uh, but stretched out it's about 105 linear feet so i i went out one day with a, a rope and a bunch of wooden stakes and staked it out and then uh dug a border talked to my friends who uh you know, agreed that it was a good idea, came out and uh, we put down, as you see the grass where it was uh, killed, we used white vinegar because one of the things the church vestry insisted on was we not use any harmful chemicals. 
So about two weeks worth of white vinegar uh, going down in the grass, and it, it basically made it dormant or killed it. And then a bunch of volunteers came in one Saturday and we started pulling grass and separating grass from soil. We did that for a day or about a half a day. And then uh, about two weeks or so, we hit, came and, uh, and someone brought, we had purchased a sideline, by the way, uh, side note. Uh, members of our church are, are professional landscapers. That was a big help because we were able to get the material and the, and the plants, the wholesale prices. Volunteers purchased that. We, we had uh, about four, eight, four yards, rather, of compost delivered. We spread it on the garden, tilled it in, uh, worked with a, a power auger to drill some holes to break up all the soil. And then one day we planted over, I think, 120 some odd plants. And there's a list. I don't know if you can play the plant list. I see up there on the screen. Yep, it's uh, linked there, just like Adrian's handouts. If anyone wants to look uh, at it later. Variety of plants. I, 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 I'm not the one to pick the plants. Uh, you know, our master gardeners uh, knew basically what they were doing as far as uh, which were good plants to purchase. So we did that. They came, laid them all out. We planted them in a day, and um, and then came back and uh, put down some straw, and then invited the parish to come and and uh, plant herbs in addition to that. So we've got uh, lavender and we've got uh, uh, rosemary and parsley and some other things growing with a number of different plants. It, it really turned out to be very attractive. But one of the reasons we did this, of course the main reason was because we, it's a good idea to, to have uh, pollinator gardens for the ecology. But it was also a community builder and uh, we, we really enjoyed the volunteers getting together to do this. Uh, There's a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of volunteer hours put into it. And I think overall, I probably not including the labor, which is enormous, but we probably have on this garden a little over a thousand dollars worth of material and plants. Wow. So it um it just it was just one of those things. You know, you 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 say something, you give it an idea, and you know, you find out you've got kindred folks who have the same uh, enthusiasm and agree yeah that's a good thing we've been thinking about that let's do it and that's what happens you know, just somebody gives the idea and it happens that's awesome thank you so much john and it's a really inspiring uh story that is this very doable group of people together kindred spirits um and it can make it happen it's awesome um the next action we're gonna talk about is contacting the powers that be. This might look a little bit different each month, um, but I didn't see Michael Garvin earlier on the Zoom. Michael, are you here with us? Okay, I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, so the bee, let's see, the Williamsburg area beekeepers for the last year uh, have been going through the steps to get an amendment added uh, to make sure that residential beekeeping is allowed. And something that's been going on in James City County, but technically uh, they're not allowed to do it um, due to the zoning. And so for the last year, they've been doing great work, um, reaching out and educating, and they have the backing of the Planning Commission, if you saw that in the, in the paper, um, which is great, uh, And the but the vote hasn't happened yet. And so if you wanna take action right now to step forward for uh, local beekeepers, then you can click the link in section one, item A, uh, and that is in a letter that I adapted from the beekeepers uh, to kind of fit our needs if you wanted to send that to your supervisor. Uh, the next thing that I've sort of been asking about and a few uh, citizens have let me know that they were concerned about this is if you want to help uh, change the way the medians in the county uh, are planted if you want to encourage native plants. Uh, that conversation is going on in the county already. And if you are interested in being a part of that or volunteering in any way to help that happen, uh, then please let me know in the exit ticket. Uh, and if you wanted to see what the corridor buffer guidelines are currently, those are linked right there also. Um, then last but not least on this page, uh, if you wanna get a little bit more involved petition wise at a state level, now uh, you can ask the governor to ban pollinator killing pesticides by following that link on the page too.
All right, the fourth action we have is support in the economy. And I wanted to say uh, that this slide is a little bee heavy and even the, you know, poll uh, honeybees are pollinators, they're not native pollinators, but they are the species that we have this working relationship with. And so they're the easiest pollinator to sort of link our economy to, if that makes sense. Um, so sort of to explain why this is so bee heavy, so honey heavy here. Um, and the first uh, things I want to point, I want to point a few things out and then hopefully we can hear from Glenn Lavender, who's here with us today from the Silverhand Meadery, about their efforts to, to stay local and to, to use local honey uh, down the road and they plant pollinators, they do great stuff. But uh, we've got supporting our local farmers market. There are local uh, beekeepers and honey sources to be supporting. Uh, Back 40 Bees is a local business that help that uh, you can go to to start your own backyard beekeeping. And Royal Bees is a beekeeping distributor. Uh, they're not in the county, but they're local-ish. And then Coleman Nursery and Ulster American Homestead Garden, they do have uh, native plants and they do have pollinator plants. I think the most important thing that I wanted to get across here is that it's really important to ask uh, your plant distributor if there have been pesticides used uh, and if the plants are native, if they're good for pollinators. They know how to answer those questions generally uh, and it's really good to ask um, and generally good to avoid uh, big corporation uh, plant providers because they tend to use the pesticide uh, neonicotinoids which end up killing pollinators so it's obviously always good to support local but for even more reasons uh, it's good to, to look locally for your plant distributors so Glenn uh, I think you're here with us. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Love to hear about Silverhand Meadery and what you guys are doing for pollinators. Yeah, I think uh, the biggest win we have at Silverhand Meadery is just the opportunity for education and talking about uh, the honeybees. So when people come in, our, uh, our key tasting experience is actually a tasting through a lot of different flavors of honey totally based on what nectar the bees were collecting. And that usually uh, sort of blows people's minds. They don't realize how many different flavors of honey there are. Like if you have bees collecting nectar just from um, orange trees, you get orange blossom honey, right? Uh, if you get them from avocado trees, you get avocado blossom honey, which is a lot like molasses. And so I think when people see the differences um, we even have, a, we just added a coriander honey, which actually has like this fennel flavor to it too. So uh, that, I think that's been really helpful for people just realizing um, and thinking more about the bees. So I, I, I do think that's sort of our, our best win. If you know where we are, we have a pretty urban location. And uh, so we're not in an area that's, uh, that we can do a whole lot with uh, fields and stuff, but we've been working on our garden over the last couple of years get more pollinators in there and uh, we would love to be able to do a bit more of that as we go. In regards to local honey, um, we have eight, eight beehives at Sweet Haven Lavender Farm uh, that we're hoping we'll get honey from eventually. It is a tough area to keep bees as I've discovered over the last five years. So the closest uh, beekeepers we can get honey from to sell at our place come from like the Charlottesville area. Uh, so if anybody ever knows of beekeepers that have enough honey to provide that are local, I mean, it usually goes so fast because everybody wants local honey, uh, but we are always on the hunt and, and trying to develop it ourselves. So uh, yeah, anyway, I hope that's helpful information. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think it's awesome that you guys are, are aware of all these things and, and striving uh, to use local honey whenever you can. And uh, I love the fact that you guys have an observation beehive. Oh, good. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, that's <laughs> like that's been incredible for us to watch. Unfortunately, like the best part of the year to watch it was during COVID when we were closed. <laughs> so we we got to watch them go from this little tiny ball to filling up two of the boxes that we've got on our wall, and they they swarmed four times. Uh, so that means. Like a beehive swarming isn't a bad thing. It means that they're reproducing. So that's actually a good thing. Uh, as beekeepers, we want to try and catch them and not lose all the swarms. But uh, with an observation hive, we're not in there as often. And 
to, to manage the queen cells and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. um, we did manage to catch three of them and put them out at the lavender farm. But yeah, if, you, if you're driving by, swing in and take a look at the observation hive. It's pretty fun. Yeah, I love it. I love that um, the educational side of it is so important. It is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Glenn. I'm glad you well, can make thank it. Thank you. I'm glad you guys are doing this. Yeah. All right. The last action we're going to talk about is sharing the video of this Zoom. Fingers crossed that I <laughs> did the right thing to record it. Um, and uh, if that doesn't work, at least we have the PDF <laughs> with all the resources to share. Um, so please fill out that exit ticket that I'm going to send in just a second. Uh, to let me know if you would like a copy of the video uh, and if you'd like a copy of the PDF of all the, these resources, I'd be really happy to send them along um, and feel free to share them. Um, does someone have a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask if I could add something about the Virginia Native Plant Society. Sure. Because we um, have a, a plant sale. We are a, a source of native plants, but it's only once a year, uh, generally at the end of April or May. But um, this year, of course, we had a, a problem because we couldn't conduct our sale uh, indoors and couldn't attract a crowd. So we had to do a kind of a limited one just with our own members. But it was a very successful sale. But what it does is, of course, is it puts more native plants into the community. Right. And we also, uh, with the leftover plants, if they all don't sell, sell we, well, we sent some of them to the botanical garden and they did it with their, um, you, you know, with their honor box where you could get a plant and put the money in the box. Um, but we really have been growing in, in awareness for people. People are aware of the plants now and, and more people want them and uh, we're really going to try to provide them. Uh, but it's not, you know, simple. We're a small organization, but it, it, we are a very good source of native plants. And, you know, for a matter of fact, for our own like Stonehouse Garden, Stonehouse Elementary School, we sponsor a um, native plant garden for the children there. And, um, you know, it's um, the, the parents get involved, the children can help weed, the parents, you know, it's a good community project. So um, anyway, I just wanted to say we're out there and want to try to support whatever we can too. How can we learn about the next plant sale? What would be the best way to get that information? Well, of course, I can give it, well, we don't know exact date, but it will be, uh, you know, it's always in the, around the end of April and the beginning of May. We try to publish it, you know, as much as we can um, between our website or Facebook page and community word by word, we spread flyers. But this year it was not very well advertised because, well, first of all, we couldn't have it. And second of all, except, you know, between it, between ourselves and you know, so we just couldn't get out and do get that word out. Um, yeah. So we'll stay tuned um, when it comes to that April. Start being on the, you know, on the lookout on Facebook. And yeah. That's a great. We should all be a part have, of that. I, I think I was talking to Charles earlier today. We'll have to try to coordinate a little bit more and. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Very good. All right. Thank you so much for uh, sticking through and being a part of this conversation today. Uh, before you leave, please, um, you please just take a minute to fill out our uh, survey, which is our exit ticket. It's a little bit of a pop quiz, but you don't actually have to answer the pop quiz questions. I really just want your email. <laughs> <laughs> just so I can see who's coming. And if you don't want me to use your email for anything, there's a part for you to say that too. Um, so please take a minute. You can uh, scan the QR code on this screen. If, you ha if you're zooming on a computer and you have your phone, uh, you can scan it there or you can look in the chat feature. I just sent the link. Um, or after this is a PDF, you can click the click here part uh, and you get to the exit, exit ticket that way. Um, so I really encourage everyone to take that uh, take that exit ticket and, and fill it out. Um, it will help us uh, with the future uh, stewardship hours and kind of get an idea of which action steps were the most helpful. Um, I wanted to show everyone on this uh, 
PowerPoint, which will be a PDF. Uh, I have some more resources here. The Virginia Native Plant Society, Master Naturalist, Department of Wildlife Resources, and the Master Gardeners. I have their websites listed. If you want some more long-term involvement with pollinators in James City County, these are some great organizations to be a part of, uh, to volunteer with, or to be tapped into. Uh, at the top, we have uh, Adrian's Handouts, uh, and another favorite pollinator plants PDF uh, for those published locally. And then in the news about backyard beekeeping, uh, I think they would really appreciate uh, if, if we were to send a few more emails the Board of Supervisors way, uh, to make sure that that gets passed. There's sort of a, a win for pollinators all around. Um, so next time, be sure to join us August 13th at 530. We'll be talking about school recycling with the famous uh, Richard Ambler, high, Jamestown High School teacher, who's been running the recycling program there successfully for a long time. Uh, he's incredible, and he'll be joining us next time to talk about school recycling before we hopefully go back to school. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Stick around if you want. We'll talk more about Keep Dream City County Beautiful, um, but if you want to go and eat some dinner, that is fine, too. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.